is stronger than 10,000 armies. Hey, come on, clap your hands. I'm marching to battle, no doubt in my mind that my God is with me and victory is mine. I'm dancing in the shadow of my enemy because God is my champion and he fights for me. Oh, God is my champion and he fights for me. Say, bigger the battle, greater my faith. There is no giant you cannot slay because you're stronger than 10,000 armies. You're stronger than 10,000. Sing, whoa. Whoa, oh, oh, oh. Cause I got a promise from the Son of Man. I'll throw off that armor and raise up my hands. Cause I know my God and I know who I am. Oh, I know my God and I know who I am. Say, bigger the battle, greater my faith. There is no giant you cannot slay. Cause you're stronger than 10,000 armies. You're stronger. You're stronger than 10,000 armies. You're stronger than 10,000. Sing ho! Whoa, oh, oh. Whoa, oh, oh. Whoa, oh, oh. Whoa, oh, oh. Sing that say. Whoa, oh, oh. Whoa, oh, oh. Whoa, oh, oh. Whoa, oh, oh. Come on and dance before the Lord. Hey.
you're stronger. You're stronger than 10,000 armies. You're stronger than 10,000. Come on and lift up your praise. Hallelujah. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Come on. Jesus, glory be to God. Woo. Come on, we need to be like David and say to the Philistine, you come with me, come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. Well, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. It's prophesied in Isaiah 9, and Jesus fulfilled this. It says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. The responsibility, listen to that, the government shall be upon his shoulder. The responsibility of complete dominion. And his name, I said his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Great and vast is his dominion. Great, that word doesn't quite do it justice. Great and vast is his dominion. This is the king we worship. This, this is the king we serve, King Jesus. Hallelujah. And this is the God we serve. The God who gave, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, hallelujah, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, amen. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Saved, and that word is sozo, saved, healed, delivered. That's the meaning of that word. Amen. Hallelujah. That is good news. That's the gospel. Come on and just lift your hands and give Jesus thanks. Hallelujah. Jesus, we honor you. We honor the name that is above every other name. King of kings, all hail King Jesus. All hail the Lord of heaven and earth. All hail King Jesus, the Savior, my Savior, your Savior, Redeemer, Protector, Strong Tower, the Chief Cornerstone, the Bread of Life, the Alpha and the Omega, the Way, the Truth, and the Life. All hail King Jesus, we worship you. Oh, we honor you in this house tonight. Have your way, Holy Spirit. All hail King Jesus, we worship you. Just begin to lift up your voice and worship and honor and reverence of the one who is so beautiful, majestic, and powerful. Oh, King Jesus. King Jesus. The King is in the room. The King is in the room. Was 
tried so hard to see it took me so long to believe it that you choose someone like me to carry your victory Perfection could never earn it. Let's sing that again. Perfection could never earn it. You give what we don't deserve. And oh, you take the broken things and raise them to glory. You are my champion. Giants fall when you stand on defeat. Every battle you won, I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I am seen in the heavenly place on defeat with the one.
Let's just lift up our hands toward heaven. And just out of the depth of your spirit, let him know how grateful that you are right now, just between you and him. A lot of people want to give him thanks, but let's, let's be grateful tonight. Ah, oh, Father, we're grateful for your liquid love that was poured out through your son, through the cross. Ah, we thank you for the finished work. Thank you for the finished. We are eternally grateful to be saved, cleansed, redeemed, washed, and filled with the power of the great Holy Spirit, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Ah, we give you praise. Thank you, Lord. We're grateful. We're grateful. We're grateful. Holy Spirit, tonight you come. You come. Have your way. You move, touch, heal, deliver, set free, preach, pray, prophesy. Use Apostle Terry and, and uh, Apostle Renee tonight. Ah, uh, we thank you. We're grateful, we're grateful. And all God's people said, amen. Come on, we can do better than that. Let's give the Lord a shout of praise. Amen. Glory, come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, welcome to the first night of a week that will change your life for all eternity. I hope you came expecting because God is reshaping our entire region through these meetings. Amen. So if you could just be seated real quick. I want to recognize all, all the five-fold ministers that are here tonight. If you're a pastor, apostle, preacher, teacher, all hearts and minds clear, would you stand? Glory to God. Look in the house. Amen. Can we give them a big God bless you? Amen. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you for coming out and supporting these meetings. We greatly appreciate, you know, there's so, God puts a high standard on relationships. Amen. Don't get silent now. I know I'm not Pastor Ron. Don't let that shake you up. Amen. Hallelujah. But we do want to honor the house here. Amen. We want to honor Pastor Ron and Pastor Pam. Thank you guys so much for opening up uh, the house here that we and, and being the host here. We greatly appreciate that. Um, Pastor Ron is like a true brother. No, I'm serious. Just let that sink in. That's all you got to do. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But we thank God for them. Amen. We thank God for each and every. We want to welcome everybody streaming in. God bless you. Thank you for taking your time. Wish you were here. You're going to wish you were here. Amen. And maybe you can make a meeting this week. But we want to welcome you. Uh, real quick, you're going to have the opportunity to sow tonight and all week. Now, this is the first night, and then tomorrow we hit our two-a-day meetings at uh, 1030 a.m., 630 p.m., amen. Come hungry, man. I, I want them to leave exhausted. I I'm like a double roll of bounty towels. I'm to quit. Whatever they drop, I'm picking up. Get your straw out of my cup. I'm going for it all. Amen. But that's the mindset that we should have. Amen. And... Uh, I'll share, I shared this this morning, but I had an angel come into my house last night. And the, this is what the angel said. Embrace what has been sent. Thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> Embrace what has been sent. God has sent us a gift from heaven. Now, they don't like us talking about them like this. Well, I, I get it. But when you... When somebody has lived this life with the consistency of excellence in ministry, then, you know, when you honor, you get to draw from that. So you're going to have an opportunity to sow uh, in, into this field, and I'm going to tell you, it's a great field to sow into. Amen. We're believing for finances to come in for them for a truck. Amen. Come on. Yeah, they need a, they need, well, not a truck. Uh, SUV, big one, loaded, amen, but uh, they need a new vehicle, and uh, we're sowing into that this, this week, so pray here from God and be obedient. There's no strong army in the body of Christ, amen, um, but what a joy it's already been, so come, expect, and believe. You know, we had uh, a lady get healed yesterday. Uh, we, you know, God said he was healing blurred vision, and uh, Pastor Ron came up to me this morning and said, yeah, we had a lady healed of, you know, got her vision back. So come expecting miracles. Expectancy is the breeding ground for a miracle. How many of you need a miracle? You see, let me, let me help you. Joyce and I are believing for things money can't buy. Mike Morton, years ago, gave me this little book from Oral Roberts called Seed Faith. And I learned from this house and from Brother Mike with that little book from Oral Roberts how to name my seed. Now, I can't buy a miracle, but I can sow into one. If you don't believe that, read the story of the Shunammite woman. It wasn't her faith that got her the child. It was her giving that opened up the portal for her to get a child. Amen. So when Joyce and I sow in meetings like this, I, my prayer is, God, I don't need the money back. Now, don't get me wrong. I need money. And we're fixing to go on a campaign, build a new sanctuary. You know, we need, we need money coming in. But I've got grandchildren that need to be delivered. Amen. I need children turned. Amen. And only one person can do that, but I can sow into the kingdom of heaven. And I'll tell God, I don't need the money back, but this is what I need. And God has never sold himself short. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. I'm from Bax Swamp, North Carolina, man. Come on. 
Hallelujah. <laughs> exactly. Praise God. I, he's never going to let me live that down. That's what brothers do. Amen. But uh, as you see on the screen, there's so many ways to give. Uh, we encourage you to be a part of that. Pray, hear from God, and be obedient. Can you say amen? Amen. Now, I know somebody's been having a problem with this because they told me, but the Lord told me on the way over here, he told me, actually told me this morning, he said, I'm healing bone spurs. And I'm like, God, well, I know somebody who's having an issue, you know, with their foot. He said, I said, I'm healing bone spurs. I said, all right. So if that's you, you just receive it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Did you bring a Bible tonight? Did you bring a notepad? Amen. Because you're going to need it. Would you stand with me tonight as we honor who God has sent us here in this region? You don't understand. They're heaven sent to us. And we claim them as ours. They may be from Texas. But we claim them as ours here in Jacksonville, Will Smith, and Oslo County is ours. They are spiritual parents to Joyce and I. So would you welcome Apostles Terry and Renee Mize tonight. Give them a God bless you. Praise the Lord. You. Thank you, thank you. Praise the Lord. Well, the applause is for Jesus. Amen. Amen. The applause is always for Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank God. Say this with me. I know God is good. Say it like you mean it. I know God is good. And I know His Word is truth. Mm -mm. I've been saying that for almost 60 years. God told me to say it a long time ago, so I figured if it's good enough for me, it's good enough for you. Amen. And I've only said it a few tens of thousands of times over the years, because if you come back to those two basic simple truths, no matter what the devil's doing, no matter how much trouble you're in, no matter what he's doing to attack, if you come back to those two basic simple truths that you know that you know that you know that you know, Brother Hagin used to say, you know it down in your knower, yeah. that God is a good God, because yeah. he is a good God. And you know that you know that you know that you know his word is truth. Jesus said that, Father, thy word is truth. Then uh, you can get out of whatever you're in. Amen. Amen. You can win. I believe you can win every time. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I think Renee's going to play or sing. Last thing she said to me in the green room was, I'm not playing and singing tonight. I said, okay. <laughs> Y'all you know, might as well sit down. Praise the Lord. I might as well sit down. Just turn it. Try out the keyboard. Hmm? Just turn it. Try out the keyboard. Oh, okay. So does that mean I'm supposed to talk? No, go ahead. <laughs> she said she's just trying out the keyboard. I said, well, all right. What? I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. Praise the Lord. Well, glory. Help yourself. You know, it's always so much fun to come into a church and play a keyboard you've never played. And, uh, and, in, and then one of these is that, you know. And, uh, but I'm just um, so glad y'all uh, love people <laughs> and uh, are going to overlook anything that, uh, you know, because church isn't a performance. It's, uh, you know, it's not let me entertain you, you know, it, it's not that. I mean, we're, we're here to honor the Lord. And then, and then, uh, as we've said here, we're really here to, to wash your feet with the word of God and minister to you and humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God so that he can exalt what he once said 
in this dynamic. So I just, I just um, wanted to sing, um, and they've been so gracious to set the piano up like, like it's just for me, you know. And so I appreciate that. That's so kind. But I just um, wrote this little song, um, oh, long, long time ago, and it was just a song of worship, Annie, that I just sat down at the keyboard uh, at choir practice one night and just begin to worship the Lord <coughs> with that. And, um, you know, I've led praise and worship all my life. My grandmother played for my, paid for my piano lessons in the third grade. <laughs> and I took piano lessons for six, for to the sixth grade. She paid for my piano lessons. And somehow the Lord gave me the ability to play by ear, too, besides read music. Amen. And uh, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, a professional. I just have learned to, to fake it till I make it and uh, play by the Holy Ghost, you know. So I appreciate the faithfulness of the Lord to help us in whatever venue and whatever situation we're in in life. Amen. I played on some pianos that would just terrify people. I mean, I've broken off fingernails between the keys. They were so far apart, you know. I mean, they, I mean, I'd be playing along and whoop, there, my finger, I'd get caught in between the white keys. It was so old. It was so old. And then the ivories were peeled off about half the keys. And uh, <laughs> I was playing at the VA one time in the ninth grade. I was playing the piano for the ninth, in the ninth grade. The men in our church had asked me to go to the VA hospital and play, you know, just hymns uh, out of the old hymn book for the veterans there. And I'm, I'm in the ninth grade, and I'm trying to read those notes and play. I knew the songs, but I, I wanted to make sure that I played them the way they thought they ought to be played, you know. And uh, I'm playing away on this keyboard that is an upright piano, and half the keys are stuck. They don't work. <laughs> so I've learned to have no pride whatsoever have no expectation for anything except Jesus. So I'm just we're just going to lift him up tonight. Amen. We came to lift up the name of Jesus. We came to lift up the name of the Lord. Everybody lift up the name of the Lord. That's easy. That shouldn't tax your mental faculties too much, you know. Can you turn me up just a tiny bit on the keyboard? If anybody wants to play along, I mean, this is so simple. You can just, you know, you can sing this in children's church. You know? We came to lift up the name of Jesus. Jesus, we came to lift up the name of the Lord, our God. We came to lift up the mighty name of Jesus. Everybody lift up the name of the Lord. One more time. Lift up the name. wonderful name of the Lord, our God, we came to lift up the mighty name of Jesus, everybody lift up the name of the Lord. Now you can do a wonderful dance in your house, singing this song, like just, you know, doing the, you know. I'm telling you, you can have your own revival of simple stuff at home. You know, you don't have to have real complicated music going on. I mean, you can rock out doing your own thing. And, you know, and just, I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to offend anybody, I, but I always think about, I can do the James Brown. You know? 
I mean, this, you know how he'd always get off on the piano and throw his coat on his shoulder? I've always wanted to do that in church. <laughs> and, just, and just have fun because angels can't do what we can do. Angels can't enjoy, you know, what we can do with the joy of the Lord and just worship God. Uh, the world tries to take everything they have and use it to glorify them and hell. But we can take everything back and begin to worship God with it. And have ha not just have fun, but I mean be so abandoned to the presence of God that we don't care about us. We don't care about us. We're not concerned about, oh, I didn't look cool. Boy, my fingernails look really good tonight, <laughs> worshiping the Lord, you know. I mean, people get carnal with stuff like that. They lift their hands and say, oh, boy, my ring sure fly shines bright in that light, <laughs> you know. And we just, uh, you know, you just start thinking about stupid stuff while you're trying to worship the Lord. So, you know, I hope that what I said didn't offend anybody, but I, I just know that God's just looking for somebody that will worship him in spirit and in truth and just get over who we are, but yet enjoy it, you know? And you can go home and just rock out, worshiping the Lord. Practice at home being weird. <laughs> get, get free at home. Get free at home. And so when you come in here, you, you don't act weird. <laughs> Be weird at home. Get all that out. Get all the eccentricity out at home. So when you come in here, you mean business. You know, you know how to work with the flow of what God's doing. And you're not all wrought up and pent up and embarrassed. You need to be free when you come in here. And because you've practiced freedom at home. Amen. Let's sing it again. Hallelujah. We came to lift up the name of Jesus. We came to lift up the name of the Lord. One more time, we want to lift up the name of Jesus. Lift up the name of the Lord. We came to lift up the mighty name of Jesus. We all lift up the name of the Lord. Sing it again with all your heart. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands one more time and glorify the King of glory, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Healer, our Redeemer, our Helper. He's our friend. Lord, we love you tonight. We praise you. Thank you for your death, burial, and resurrection. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. El hallelujah. One, I'm going I'm to tell you this, and then I'll... And then I'll um, move off the scene. Um, one time in my house many years ago, I guess 35 years ago, uh, maybe even a year or two longer, I was, um, we, we were pastoring in Corpus Christi and there was just some strife in our church and it was so dis, you know, who, who, th who thought that could happen? You know? <laughs> and uh, I was just so concerned about it all and there was just this yeah, 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 yeah going on and I, w I didn't know how to fix it. And uh, I was just so concerned about it, and I was just walking around my house, and I was going, <sighs> you know, I just felt like, oh, my goodness, this is, you know, what do I do about this? And I was trying to pray in tongues and, and figure out the maneuver. And in my mind, I was upstairs, and I saw myself 
standing at the top of the stairs, going down the stairs with my hands raised, shouting the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all I had. That's all I had. And I had learned from Brother Havegan, if you see yourself doing something, just act on it. Do it right there. Don't think about it. Just act on it. So I just started, I just got the top of my stairs and started yelling the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I yelled that. It was a long kind of a stairs. And I yelled that all the way down the stairs. And when my foot hit the floor, I was fine. I was just fine. I mean, there was no more oppression. There was no more concern. There was just freedom. And I, I have learned since then, all these years that have followed, that the simple things that you obey God with, you know, don't, don't look for the, the, you know, go climb a mountain and, and go do this and, <laughs> you know, uh, sacrifice, you know, this or that or the other, give up Cheetos or something. <laughs> I mean, you know, you don't, don't, look for the simple obedience that you can do before the Lord. Just listen and do it. And if you'll act on it, the glory of the Lord will get on that thing by, by your obedience and you will deliver yourself. Amen. You will deliver yourself from the worry, the fear, the anxiety, uh, all the things that could be of, of a frustration to you. And if you'll, if you'll begin to act on that, especially as it worships the Lord. Everybody shout tonight, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you what, I just go home tonight and spend two or three minutes just yelling that all over your house. I mean, just try, just try it out. See how, how, how you come out of it. I mean, you're not going to feel any worse, <laughs> you know. You're going to probably feel really good after you say it about 10 or 12 times and just magnify the death, the burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our covenant, what Terry's been teaching here with those five smooth stones, that we have a covenant and it's the establishment of the covenant in our lives. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, every day, find a way to establish your soul in the things of the Word of God. Well, we've got some wonderful products back there. I haven't gone back there to look and see what's back there, but I did glance at a couple of things that have to do with... Uh, Terry's done a great series on the basics of faith, and I always love it when people can, can put their own self through Bible school. You know, you can take three weeks and listen to a series of, of tapes. Say, I'm going to put myself through three weeks of Bible school, and I'm going to learn faith, and I'm going to learn how to do this, and just do a refresher course. Uh, like I think at 2 Corinthians, you said 13.5, where it says, examine yourself, Paul said, to see whether you be in the faith or not. And so you need to, you, need to, you know, do a checkup from the neck up from time to time to make sure that you are really in the faith and you're not just parroting something that you learned five years ago, that you're doing it in faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we've got a, 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 a Internet program and then also a television program that we uh, put out a new one every Thursday, and we have those cards back there. Did anybody not get a card? Uh, we've got it's up here on the screen. If you want to take a picture of that, and then we also have cards uh, back there that'll that'll help you take home, and you can see where we're on all the time. We're on YouTube, we're on Rumble, we're on an internet station, we're on the Now Network, which goes all over uh, a lot of places in Africa and the Middle East, and so we're just trying to, you know, help the Lord uh, have a broader playing field to minister to people with. Amen. And so we just want to be a blessing to you in that regard. And um, that's all we're here for is just to help you with that. But, you know, let it get down on the inside of you that the power of God and the grace of God is in you to do your life, for you to win in your life. If you survived your life and you're here tonight, raise your hand. <laughs> Say, I have survived my own life. Hallelujah. I have survived my own life, and I'm here tonight to tell about it. And the Lord's going to help you. Just keep going and getting better and growing and being stronger. But there's an enemy out there that wants to kill you, wants to destroy you, wants to wreck your home, your health, your finances, your children, take everything you have. And he's got plenty of helpers here and even in this country to try to destroy you. 
So you've got to be the strongest you've ever been in your whole life. You've got to come up higher to the things of God, and you've got to be stronger and greater and more confident in the Word of God than you've ever been before. Don't coast. Don't, don't assume. I, those, those are my two old age rules is, is take nothing for granted and assume nothing <laughs> because of just where we live in today's society. We live in the most complicated, dangerous society that's been on the earth in America. And so I want to encourage you, get strong. Don't stay weak. Don't stay fearful. Stay, get stronger and stronger and stronger every day. God bless you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And he would come up and grab these things. Thank you. As, uh, as Jim was talking a while ago, uh, and he mentioned uh, <clears throat> Oral Roberts' book, Miracle of Seed Faith, what, do you know what year that would have been, Jim, that they gave you that book? <clears throat> Excuse me. 86? Well, you got to the party late. <laughs> wow. He wrote that in 1969. And I got it in 1969. And it changed my life in 1969. And it changed your life in 1986. I heard Jerry, my good friend Jerry Savelle was preaching the other day, and he said, I'll tell you what changed my life is I got a hold of Oral Roberts' book, Miracles of Eden. There is no telling how many lives have been changed. Now, Jackie and I, my first wife and I, Jackie's in heaven now, but we were, we were in the Army, and uh, I, we had gotten drafted. I had gotten drafted on our wedding day. Now, that's a bummer. We, uh, we went to the church. We got married. We left the church, went to the reception, left the reception, started out of town on our honeymoon, and I thought, I'll swing by and check the mail at the post office. And I went by and checked the mail at the post office, and I had this letter from President Nixon. And he said, congratulations. <laughs> That's how it starts out, that congratulations. Your friends and neighbors have selected you to, we've got this little thing going on in Southeast Asia, blah, 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 blah. And uh, so I just saw the envelope and being the wise man that I am, I just stuck it back in the mailbox and <laughs> shut the door and didn't tell my brand spanking new bride that I was drafted. I thought, well, I'll go on our honeymoon first, and then I'll, then I'll tell her. And so, uh, uh, so we uh, left me owning my own business, making lots of money, and it was kind of a cash business and cash cow business. No, it wasn't drugs. I was selling produce. And... Uh, <clears throat> So, uh, and Jackie was a dental technician, so she made good money. I made lots of money. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden, we're in the Army making $126 a month. Now, we was used to wasting $126 a day, right? We never thought about going to the grocery store and buying, you know, for two or three days in advance. We thought about food when we got hungry. And we said, oh, I'm, what's, what's for dinner? I don't know what's for dinner. Well, I don't know. What do you want? I don't know. What do you want? You want to eat out? You want to go get some of the store? And then we went and either ate out or bought something and cooked it. But there's no preparation, you know, and we just had the money to do what we wanted to. And now we got $126 a month. And uh, Uncle Sam doesn't pay too well. Some of y'all living in this town would know that. And uh, so I, I had always paid my tithes all my life. Got saved when I was six. Pastor said you need to pay your tithes. Mama said you need to pay your tithes. The Bible said you need to pay your tithes. So who am I to argue with that? So I paid my tithes and gave offerings. And so any little odd job I had, from the time I was a kid, any little odd job I had, man, I paid my tithes and I gave my offerings. And, and, and I never thought about it. Never thought a thing in the world about it. I went to church, happy to go to church, delighted to go to church. And we had praise and worship, and it was great. And we had announcements, and it was great. And then Pastor stood up to take up the offering. I said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I've got to give him the offering. Sure, don't mind that. Don't have a problem with that. Just hadn't thought about it. And so here would come the plate down the aisle, and I'd grab something and put it in. Never thought about it. Never prayed over it. Never put any faith on it. Just, just you're supposed to do it. Love God. Happy to do it. And I remember one time when I was a teenager and had a little bit better job, making a little bit better money uh, before I owned my own business. Uh, and my mama said to me one day, she said, uh, Terry, I, I know you're a tither and a giver. And I said, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And she said, well, I just want to give you some advice. I said, yes, ma'am, what is it? And she said, don't you dare 
expect anything back from God. I said, oh, no, ma'am, I wouldn't put any pressure on God. No, oh, uh, we, no, I, I, I won't expect anything. Here comes the plate, I give, there goes the plate, don't think another thing about it. Sunday morning, here comes the plate, give. Sunday night, here comes the plate, give. Wednesday night, here comes the plate, give. Youth service on Friday night, here comes the plate, give. Never thought a thing in the world about it. Just happy to do it. And it's Bible, and so God blessed it. It's, it's a law, so God blessed it. If you plant, you harvest, right? So God blessed it. And so uh, Jackie and I got married. I had my business. She was a dental technician, making all this money. All of a sudden, now we're in the Army, and we're making $126 a month. And we've got a brand new house we just bought. We fill that whole house up with brand new furniture on the American plan of credit. <laughs> yay, America. Yay, credit. Had a car we're paying for. Had furniture we're paying for. Had other stuff we're paying for. You know, she needed a new washer and dryer. All right, we got washer and dryer. Now we owe Sears or somebody for that. Right? And that's fine. I got lots of money. But now I'm in the Army and I don't got lots of money. And those bills are coming due. And uh, that wasn't fun. And so uh, every month when I got my paycheck from the United States Army, I uh, wrote out my tithe check. And a little extra for offering. And then two or three ministries that we partnered with, you know, back then probably wasn't very much, maybe $5 a month or something. We partnered with some two or three ministries that had come through my, my home church, gave to them every month as partner. And, uh, and I recommend that. If you hadn't done it, you ought, to, you ought to hook up with the greatest plan there is. And uh, so uh, we'd send that off. Didn't think about it, didn't pray about it, didn't put any faith on it, didn't know I was supposed to. Wouldn't dare expect anything back from God. <clears throat> and one day we had a long weekend or some, some way or another. The Army gave me several days off. Might have been on a holiday or something. I don't know. And uh, so we drove from... Uh, uh, I, was at, I was at Fort Bliss, Texas, air defense, you know, Patriot missiles and stuff like that. Only Patriots were just being born back then. We still had the old, uh, what, minute, minute, well, whatever was it before that. And now there's all kind of stuff since then. But, uh, and, and drove up to, to eastern Oklahoma to where her grandma lives. Now, her grandma, I absolutely loved because that woman got the Holy Ghost, Cece. The day he first fell, she was there. I was convinced. <laughs> and I'd walk in that house, and she'd be praying in tongues. And Jackie and Jackie's mom and all, all of her grandmother relatives, all her kids and grandkids, they just ignored her because they'd heard these things forever. And, you know, I was the new grandson, and, boy, I tell you, I like that kind of stuff. I'd go in, and I'd say, Mom, tell me about the day you got the Holy Ghost. And, boy, she'd, ooh, shoo, ooh. And boy, and she'd... She'd tell me, boy, I was walking across the room. I remember the day, and the Holy Ghost hit me and knocked me down in the floor and slid me all the way across the room. And back then, beds were high. You could get under them. <laughs> slid me under the bed, and I was under the bed with my hands out, out of the bed just, just praying in tongues for several hours. And so I'd just visit with her and spend time with her. And they're all in there just visiting with all the family, you know. <clears throat> and while we was there that weekend, she said, Terry, Mom said, Mom said, Terry, Oral Roberts just sent me a book, and I think you'd like it. And I said, well, give me. Give me, give me, give me. If Oral wrote it, I'll like it. And uh, she gave me the miracle of seed faith. Brand spanking new, 1969. I was 19 years old. And uh, I took that thing back with me. She said, take it home with you. I took it back out to the fort. And uh, I read the words off that thing. I mean, I read it and read it and read it. I ate it, Gary. I ate it. And, and the only way I could explain it to you all is the way I could explain it to Jackie. I said, I don't know how to explain what's happened to me. But I said, this book got born inside me. I don't know any other way to explain it. Somehow or another, that book got in here. And Oral said, in that book... He said, you know, farmers don't plant for fun. Farmers plant for profit. And I thought, well, duh. And he said, farmers plant knowing, positively knowing, they're going to get a harvest because it's a law. He said, it's such a law. You sure messed my sermon up tonight. I was going somewhere else, but man, I may ride this horse. 
this, this horse, this horse has helped me for since 1969. <clears throat> I think you can still get it free for nothing if you write Richard Roberts, Tulsa, Oklahoma. I mean, Oral never sold it, to my knowledge. He always gave it away free. I think Richard probably still does. And uh, if he doesn't, tell me and I'll pay for it for you. But uh, uh, anyway, we, we got out there and I read that thing and read that thing and read that thing. And, and Oral, said, Oral said, you know, don't ever, ever, ever give an offering, Pam without praying over it. And I thought, I've never prayed over an offering in my life. He said, never give an offering without putting faith on it. I thought, I've never put faith on an offering in my life. He said, don't ever give an offering that you don't expect something back. He said, that's not the reason you give, but it's the law, and if you don't agree with it, you're, you're, you're going to miss out on what's rightfully yours. It'd be like planting seed and then just going off and never checking on the field again. And that harvest comes up and grows, and you're not there to, to get it. And, uh, and he said just a lot of tremendous, 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 tremendous things. And he said no farmer ever, 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 ever woke up early in the morning and told his wife, I'm going out to North 40 to reap the harvest this, this, uh, this morning, knowing full well he never planted the North 40. He said no farmer ever goes out to a field that he's never planted and says, give me a harvest, give me a harvest, give me a harvest. He said, it doesn't work that way. And, and he said it's such a law that bankers know the law and bankers will loan money based on the law. He said a farmer can go into the bank and sit down in front of the banker and say, Mr. Banker, I've got this much land, this many acres, and I need to borrow this much money to buy this much seed to put in this many acres, which will give me this many harvests, and I'll pay you back plus interest. And the banker says, okay, if you put this much seed in this much land, and, 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 and it'll give you this much harvest, and I'll get money, and you'll get money, and we'll both be happy. So they loan money based on the law of God. Now, it's a natural law. I understand that. But the, the reason it's a natural law is because it's a spiritual law. God invented the law first. When, when, when Noah and the, and the other seven people came out of the boat, out of the ark, the only, the only eight people alive on the whole planet, they're rich. They own it all. They own North Carolina. I mean, they own Texas. They, 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 own, uh, they own all of it. There are only eight people on the planet. And uh, when they came out of the ark, first thing they did is made an altar and sacrificed some animals to God. I've had people tell me, now, nah, Terry, I couldn't have done that because after all, they only took two animals in the ark, and if they had done that, they'd have killed them. I said, what do you think those animals were doing in that boat for a year? <laughs> they were having babies. <laughs> they, they, had, they had more animals than they started with. Right. Why? Yeah. Because there's a law. There is a law. And God said, and so they made this sacrifice, and God said, now, get your, get your tape recorder, get your notepad. I'm going to tell you your purpose for living on planet Earth. He said, same thing he told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Get your notepad, get your, get your tape recorder. I'm going to tell you your reason for being in the garden. What is it, Lord? You ready for this? Yeah, I'm ready. Multiply and be fruitful. He said, well, Adam and Eve messed that up, so he said to Noah and the, and, and the, and the seven, multiply and be fruitful. And then he said this to him. He said, now, as long as time remains. I tell you what, you, 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 need, to, you need to write this one on your arm or something. Amen. As long as time remains, there will be seed time and harvest. There will be night and day. There will be hot and cold. And there'll be winter and summer. That is, those are immutable laws. Immutable means incapable of change. They cannot change. Amen. Man cannot change them. Right. Right? right? Somebody wrote me, Gary, this last, uh, this last summer, somebody wrote me a text and said, Brother Terry, prophet so-and-so, she, she named some prophet. She said, prophet so-and-so prophesied it's going to be really hot this July. And I said, I wrote her back and I said, no disrespect to prophet so-and-so, and I'm not a prophet, but I, I prophesy. <laughs> it'll be hot next July. <laughs> this is Texas, and it'll be hot the next July, and it'll be hot the next July, and it'll be hot the next July, and it'll be hot the next July. You know I know that? Because Genesis 8 says, as long as time remains, there'll be seed time and harvest, There'll be night and day. There'll be summer and winter. There'll be hot and cold. So you can take that to the bank. Yeah. Amen? It's a law. Yeah. If you ever want to figure God out, I've preached this all over the world. If you ever want to be God's psychiatrist, 
and you want to put God on the couch and psychoanalyze him, it will always come back to seed time and harvest. Amen. Everything he does and everything he's about is seed time and harvest. Yeah. You trace everything back with God, it's going to be seed time and harvest. You reap what you sow. Yeah. You did something bad, you're going to get something bad. Yeah. Now, the Buddhists call that karma. God calls that seed time and harvest. Yeah. Yeah. It's a law. It's a law. Karma is not a law. There's no law based on it. But seed time and harvest says if you put you put in, you're going to get back more than you put in. Right. It's a law, right? And so I read that, and I'm reading that book, and I'm out there in 1969, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a private in the Army, and I'm, I'm, I'm in OJT. I'm, tra I'm training, and then supposed to go to Vietnam, and here we go, and I'm reading all this stuff, and uh, it just changed my life. Now, Jackie, bless her heart, whenever we got out there, uh, they paid us one time a month, and she had to go to the PX. Most of y'all know that means the grocery store on the, on the military base, post exchange. And uh, she was supposed to shop for a month. She didn't know how to shop for a month. I didn't know how to shop for a month. We shopped for 30 minutes. You know, we, we'll, we'll buy some more tomorrow. We'll buy some more the next day. We'll buy some more. No, in the Army, you don't buy some more the next day. You get paid once. And so that $126 a month, and when I took a tithe out of it and took the offering out of it, now it never dawned on me, never entered my brain, Jim, to not pay tithes, well, we can't afford it. Oh, no, 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 you can't afford not to. And that never entered my mind. There ain't no way I'm going to not tithe. And so, I, but by the time I took our tithe out of that $126 and then our offerings and our partnership uh, with two or three people out of that, there wasn't a whole lot left. And then she's supposed to go to the PX and buy groceries for us for a month. And it didn't work. The, 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 the money ran out and the food ran out before the month every time. So it wasn't fun, right? until I read that book. And I told her, I said, hey, we just, we, life has just changed. Life has just changed. We ain't playing this no more. And so then when we got our little $126 check, we prayed over it for the first time ever. And we wrote that tithe check out and prayed over it for the first time ever. Put faith on it for the first time ever. Forget what mama said, boy, don't you expect nothing back from God. Forget that. Right. <laughs> and in those partnerships we had, we wrote those checks out and we prayed over them. And we put faith on them. And we sowed them into the ground, into good soil. We sowed good seed in good soil. Amen? And that was a long time ago. And we sat right here yesterday morning. And they took up the offering, and Renee wrote out a check, and we prayed over it and sowed it and put faith on it. And we will the next time, and the next time, and the next time. I've had, I've had so many pastors over the years tell me, said, Terry, you, you and Renee are the only traveling ministers we've ever had in our church to give in our offerings. You know, you're giving our Sunday morning, the church's Sunday morning offering. I said, well, I, would, I wouldn't miss. Man, I, I know the law. So all of a sudden, things changed. My salary didn't change. The $126 a month didn't change. But all of a sudden, stuff started showing up. All of a sudden, these, these army ladies said, came over and said, Honey, we're going to Jackie. They said, we're going to take you to the PX and show you how to shop for a month. <laughs> and that changed our lives, you know. And all of a sudden, people gave us this, and somebody gave us that. Somebody walked up and bought us that and bought us this and gave us, took us to dinner or, or uh, you know. Provided a transportation when I didn't have transportation for a while. And I mean, just our lives just begin to change and change. That book changed my life. And now I think I can say safely that since it was from 1969, still working till now, from 1986, still working till now, to whenever Jerry Savelle got his, still working till now, to, to other ministers I've talked to, I, I always ask them, what year did you get that? Is it still working? Everybody says, oh, yeah, it's still working. I mean, it's just amazing that, that you get it in, in your head and in your heart and in your spirit that, oh, my God, this is a law. God established this as a law. God said it in Genesis, and it'll never, ever, ever stop. Never, ever. And so whenever I got out of the Army, I moved to Mexico as a missionary. As soon as we got out of the Army, we gone. Thought we was going to go as soon as we got married, but we had to go play with Uncle Sam first. And, and then we went. 
And so I, I met a missionary by the name of Wayne Myers. Now, Wayne Myers is now 101 years old. Renee and I were just with him just a few weeks ago in Mexico City. Still preaching. One of the biggest givers I know. And he's a faith missionary. He's not on TV. He doesn't have millions of partners. He doesn't have a TV ministry. He doesn't have, he's not well known. He just lives to give. And I learned something from him that he called living to give. And so I went from, from being in my church as a little boy just giving in order to give. I just gave because you're supposed to. No faith on it, no, no prayer on it, just, just, just giving to give. Just because the Bible says give, give. And where sinners don't even do that, sinners just live to live. They just get up this morning, go to work, come home at night and go to bed, get up in the morning, go to work, come home at night and go to bed, get up in the morning, go to work, come home at night and go to bed, get up in the morning, go to work, come home at night and go to bed. That's their life. They just live to live. There's no purpose. There's no reason. They're just here because they're breathing. Y'all breathing? We're here. And then church people do the same thing with their money. They're just not just living to live. They're just giving to give. And that's what I did. But then I read Oral's book and I said, whoa, this is a game changer. I'm no longer living to live. I'm, 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 I'm giving in order to live. If I have a bill, if I have a need, I can take a seed and some money and I can plant that and I can pray over it. I'm giving for a need. Like Jim said, he learned to name his seed. And so, so I can give for this need and God will give me a harvest. I can pay the need. And so that'll work. So Jackie and I started doing that, and it worked, and it worked, and it worked, and it worked until we got to Mexico. When we got to Mexico, I run into Wayne Myers, and he's not living to live. He's not giving to give. He's not even giving in order to live. This guy is living in order to give. He's here to give. I'm on planet Earth to bless somebody, to help somebody. Now all us Christians use a little cliche that most of us don't believe, say, say, I'm blessed to be a blessing. I'm blessed to be a blessing. I'm blessed to be a blessing. Well, are you really? You really are blessed to be a blessing. The question is, are you being a blessing when you get blessed? That's the kicker. That's the catch. If you're going to go in business with God, you've got to keep your word. If you're going to go in business with God, you've got to hold your end up. Isn't that right? I've had guys come to me for 50 years and say, Brother Terry, I'm in business with God. Me and God. Me and God. And I said, well, that's great. I'll pray over your business. Would you pray over me? Yeah, I'll pray over your business. Let me ask you a question. You and God are in business? Uh-huh. You're in God 50-50? Yeah, yeah. I said, okay. Does God have checking privileges? What? Does God have checking privileges? Is God able to give? Is God's job to bring the money in and your job is to take the money out? Or does God get to take it out too? Are you really in business with God? Does he have checking privileges? Can he give? And most of them don't until I told them that, and then they changed, and then their income went up. Because you start getting in real business with God to where he says to you, you know, God would say to me, uh, Terry, I want you to give uh, $100 to this missionary. Well, if I had $100, or if my wife had it in her purse, or if it was in the bank, or if it was in the cookie jar, or if it was under the mattress, and somewhere I knew where it was. <laughs> it existed, and I know where it is. Then, that's, then, then I call that uh, giving of the known. I know I've got it. And that doesn't, take, that doesn't really take faith. That takes obedience. Right. Yeah. That's good. That's real good. But then if God says, Terry, I want you to give $1,000 to this missionary, I say, well, wait a minute. I don't have $1,000. I don't think Renee's got it in the purse. I know it's not in the cookie jar or in the mattress, not in the bank. So... All right, you tell me to give it. I'll commit to you to give it. Me and you'll go in partnership together, and you provide it, and I'll give it. But now my problem is i got to keep my word. Once he provides it, I can't say, oh, look here, I think I'll go fishing, or I'll go on a vacation. Or, no, no, i got to do what I said I'd do because God knows whether you do or don't. God knows what we give, but he also knows what we keep. Isn't that right? See, Jesus did something really, really rude. We'd consider it very rude. He was at church one day, and they was taking up the offering, and he just walked up to the front, leaned on the podium, and started looking in the offering basket. And these folks are coming out there giving their offering, paying their tithes, giving their offering. They all paid tithes, all of them. And uh, he'd look in there, and he'd look at them. 
Look in there and look at them. Look in there and look at them. And I imagine since he's just right there, they probably gave a little better. <laughs> and after it was all said and done, he did something else we'd think is very, very, very rude. He told everybody who gave what. He said, hey, y'all want to know who gave the most? This little widow woman right over here gave more than all you guys. And they said, she did not. I was dropping some heavy change in there since you were staring at me and all. <laughs> she just put in two mites. Yeah, but see, the kicker that we've never understood is that God doesn't count amounts. He counts percentage. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Tithing is the great equalizer. Because if it was amounts, the poor guy could never catch up to the rich guy. The rich guy's always got the advantage he can give more than the poor guy. But if it's percentage, then 10% for the poor guy and 10% for the rich guy is the same. It's still 10%. Right. Are y'all here? Yes. So, so when she came to give, she only gave the amount-wise nothing. Two mites. Nothing. But percentage-wise, how much did she give? 100%. This guy comes up here and drops a couple thousand dollars in the plate. Percentage, uh, money-wise, amount-wise, that's a pretty big deal. But percent-wise, compared to what he's got in his pocket or in the bank or at home, it's nothing what she gave. She gave 100%. Maybe he gave 10%, 15%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, but she gave 100 So she, she gave more than they did. Isn't that right, Vanessa? Yeah, absolutely. I see your wheels turning. Uh-huh, I know that. That book, you sure messed up my sermon, brother. I was going somewhere else, and you said living to give, and my ears perked up. I mean, you said it's miracle of seed faith, and my ears perked up. And so I met Brother Wayne Myers, and he was not doing what I was doing. He was living in order to give. And I told my wife, I said, I said, this guy acts like, and he didn't do this, but I said, it's like he just goes out on the street corner and just hands out money when people pass by. And he didn't do that, but I mean, that, that's the attitude. How can I bless you? How can I help you? How can I give to you? How can I, how can I help you? What can I do for you? And uh, so I, I told her, we were just brand new. We just had gotten to Mexico. We were green as a gourd, and we just got there. And, and yet we spent the night at their house and said, look at these people. Look at their whole attitude. Man, and so in their guest room, in their bedroom, I said to Jackie, I said, hold my hands. We're going to make a commitment right now that we're going to embrace this lifestyle. This is the lifestyle. I said, we, I said what we've been doing is working. I said, what we did, what we've been doing, reading Oral's book, that's working. But this is, this is bigger than that. This is higher than that. This is a step up from that. And so I said, oh, this whole hand. so we prayed and we agreed. And we said, Father, from this day forward, we move from giving in order to live to get to living in order to give. And I said, Father, I, I make a vow to you that to the best of my ability, I will not go to bed at night without having given something to somebody. I said, I'm not making a law out of it because I'm not going to get in bed and say, oh, my God, I didn't give. i got to get up and go give. I'm, I'm not going to put bondage on me because law is bondage and bondage is law. And I said, but to the best of my ability, we're going to give something to somebody every day it may be a smile, it may be a handshake, it may be, but to the best of my ability, it's going to be monetary. You know, and so we, we and I said, and I'll never be broke. Right. Holding, holding my hands, I said, we'll never be broke. And I said, Father, should we get down to the, to the point of where, where we're down to, you know, a really big, big, big bill, like $5? Because we didn't have much money. We didn't have any money. So if we get down to $5, I said, I'm not going to squeeze that and squeeze that and squeeze that and squeeze that and hold on to it for 10 days. I'm going to get rid of it. And then I'll be broke, and then you've got to help. And so, I mean, if we got down to $10 or $5, that was my limit, $10 or $5. We got down and said, oh, my Lord, I'd go give it away. Okay, Lord, I'm broke. And I told you I'd never be broke. I work for God's son and company, and you pay quite well, and I'm, op and I'm operating your law. I'm doing your law. I'm about your business. So I expect a return, and pow, here he'd come. And I've been doing this for 56 years. I'm not just saying that I started this last week. 
I mean, it works and it works and it works. Renee's known me for 50 years. Now, y'all know that we've only been married almost 10 because she and her husband, Dean, and me and my wife, Jackie, were best friends for 40 years, and they were pastors and we were missionaries and great friends traveled together, vacationed together, our kids grew up together. And she can tell you we've lived that way. She, you know, she knows me when I didn't have two pennies to rub together, and all of a sudden, there's some money. I knew, I knew her and Dean when they didn't have two pennies to rub together, and all of a sudden, there's some money. I remember one night about uh, 50 years ago, we were at Lakewood Church together. They were there, and we were there. We'd come up from Mexico, and they, they were on staff there. When they was the organist, and Dean was the associate pastor of Brother John Osteen. And uh, they didn't have any money, and we didn't have any money. We was just there at the church. And that night, somebody gave me some money. And I took off running in the church, in the big church. I'm looking for Dean. And somebody at the same time on the other side of the church had given him some money, and he took off running, and he's looking for me. And when we found each other, we ran up to each other and both went, here, I'm going to give you this. And both of us had a $50 bill in our hand. Wow. You know, here, we're going to give you this. And it just got on us. Right. Yeah, that's right. I remember one time Renee and, and, and Dean and Jackie and I sat around talking about faith and how faith works and how faith's supposed to work. And Renee said, Renee said uh, I just get so tired of having to believe God for the toothpicks. You know, we said, we know how you feel. And everybody, having to believe God and having to use faith to get toothpicks. Well, but it worked. We got the toothpicks. Amen? I remember one time I was flying on an airplane with Buddy Harrison. Buddy Harrison, if you don't know, is Kenneth Hagin's son-in-law. And Buddy and I were flying somewhere together one time and back in the 70s. And uh, he turned to me in the seat and he said, Terry, i got some good news for you. I said, what's that? And he said, he said, thus saith the Lord, from this day forward, you'll never have $100 problems again, ever again. And I said, thank God. Praise the Lord. Thank God. He said, you'll have $1,000 problems. I said, well, that didn't help. <laughs> and he said, and then you won't have $1,000 problems anymore. You'll have $10,000 problems. I said, I want you to stop now. You know? <laughs> and, you know, I, I have been with lots of major ministries over the years. I've been friends with lots and lots. God's always given me favor with ministers that are older than me and, 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 and well-known ministries. And so I've been I, not just acquaintances, but I mean friends in their homes or in our homes. I mean friends, you know, fathers in the faith. And... Uh, and I remember telling Jackie one time, I said, did you ever notice that we know, you know, Teal Osborne and Oral Roberts, and I'm not just name dropping, I'm just saying that we, we know these people, we know Jim Baker and Charlotte, we know, we know uh, you know, this one and this one and this one and this one. And I said, did you ever notice that, that our incomes are different? But did you ever notice none of us have enough money, we're always believing God? You know, where Jackie and I had to have a few thousand dollars, you know, to, to meet our budget, or a few hundred when we first started, and then a few thousand, then a few ten thousand. You know, Jim Baker's believing for, you know, four million a day or something. You know, Oral Roberts believing for eight million a day. I mean, I mean, it didn't matter who you are and how much money you had, God's not going to tell you to do something you can do. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Faith, faith is not going to tell you to do something you can do. Anybody can do what you can do. Sinners can do what you can do. Amen? That great missionary in, to, to, to inland China back in the 1800s, I mean 150 years ago, uh, Hudson Taylor, he said this. He said, first, when God tells you to do something, first it's impossible. He said, then it's hard, and then it's done. And so you need to take that on yourself. First it's impossible. When God tells you to do something, you're, that's impossible. I mean, I'd suggest you don't say that. <laughs> but then pretty soon, it's just hard. And then pretty soon, it's like, hey, that's done. Where'd that come from? I don't know, but I'm sure glad it came. But, see, but anyway, this series is about that, living to give. I saw Renee had brought this up here, so I kept it when, when Matthew came up here to get them. Living to give. This, 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 this will change your life. I don't know how many CDs are in here. Four? Four. Well, thank you. You have this? Well, good. Did it work? You going to find out? All right. All right. You going to find out? Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Now that you ruined my sermon, what am I going to do? Y'all stand up with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your word. 
Father, living to give is the greatest thing I ever got into in all my life because it's a lifestyle. Everything you do is lifestyle. Father, you're about life. You're about your people. You're about blessings. And so, Father, we thank you for ministering to us tonight by the Holy Ghost, ministering to us tonight by the Holy Ghost, by the Holy Ghost, Give us revelation knowledge. Give us understanding. Give us wisdom. Lord, that we take your word and apply it in real life situations. Father, I've talked to so many Bible school students and graduates and talked to somebody today in this very same thing. And uh, they say, well, I went to such and such a Bible school, but I didn't learn all this stuff. I said, no, Bible school teaches you, teaches you principles, but real life teaches you practical application so there's a difference in knowing it learning it hearing it and living it but we're in the situation in real life to where we need practical application we need it to work like tomorrow we need it to pay the rent we need it to buy a car we need it to buy a house we need it to do this to do this to do this to do this and that's where it works so we're not operating theory we're not operating something we have a head knowledge of. We're, we let it move down into our spirit where we have a heart knowledge and an understanding of the laws of God and the laws of faith and the laws of giving and receiving, the law of seed time and harvest. And so we thank you for it. And we give you glory and honor and praise and majesty and dominion in Jesus' name. And thank you in advance for what you'll do this week. Thank you for Monday Night Christians. You don't have as many of them as you used to, but you sure like them when you can get them. Thank you for Monday Night Christians. And thank you for Tuesday Morning Christians. I'm expecting these day services, Father, to be over the top. You've laid something on my heart that I haven't preached in decades and decades and decades, and I don't even know any preacher that preached it. But I've preached it all over the world, just hadn't preached it in America much. I believe you'd help me get it out this week because it's, it's, it's vital, it's necessary. And we thank you for it and give you glory and honor and praise and majesty and dominion in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Well, go ahead and be seated. Now it's 8 o'clock, and since I've taken so much time, then I won't, I won't take a, a lot more time. We start at, what, 6.30? All right. Just give me a little while here. And uh, we'll see what the Lord can do and will do and has done. Amen. Last yesterday we talked about the five smooth stones. And again, that's not a that's not a um, it's not a definite. I mean you don't you don't have to say, I know exactly what David's stones were. That's just something came up in my spirit. I told you that yesterday. I, I, I just said years and years and years ago, I, I, I said, Lord, is there any significance to those five smooth stones? Why did David stop and pick five smooth stones? Uh, when he went out to meet Goliath. Is there any significance to that? Is there anything I ought to know about that? Is there any spiritual? Because I've heard preachers preach about that all my life. And I've heard them say, David knew Goliath had four brothers he's going to have to kill. Well, maybe so. Or, or, or somebody said, it's, it's the apostle, probably the evangelist, pastor, and teacher. I said, I don't think that's right. You can't throw an apostle at somebody. Uh, and, and I'm sure there's lots of answers. But what came up in my spirit, God didn't speak it to me. I just said, is there any significance that I need to know? And he just came right up in my spirit and said, it's the name. It's the blood, it's the word, yeah. it's the covenant, it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Say the name. The name. Say the word. The, word. the, blood. the blood. The covenant. The, covenant. the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. And see, that's the order. I just got it out of order, but that's the order. And I'm not, I'm not giving you a test on this, uh, but that's the order we actually do it. When you have a crisis at your house or in your body or with your kids or in your home or in your business or in anything else, or somebody's about to hit you with a car, you know, the first thing you do is what? The name. You say, in Jesus' name. The name. The name of Jesus. Because Peter said it's, it's the name and faith in this name that then you see this crippled man standing before you whole, Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 and 4. He pulled the cripple up from him and said, rise up and walk. He said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ. And rise up and walk. Or in Spanish, plata ni oro no tengo, pero lo que tengo te doy en el nombre de Jesucristo. Levántate y anda. Sounds better in Spanish, doesn't it? Yeah, a little bit. It always sounds better in Spanish. And so, so, but he said it's the name. It's the name. 
It's el nombre. It's the name and faith in this name. Amen. Hija de rey. Amen. We may switch here. Y'all get the interpretation in tongues if I speak if I preach in Spanish. It's the name and faith in this name. Peter Peter summed it up for us. He put it in a capsule. It's the name. Don't stand here and look at us like we did something special. It's the name. Yes, sir. And faith in that name. Yes. So the first thing you do when you're in trouble is in the name of Jesus. When that hitchhiker stuck that gun in my ribs and I was 24 years old and I'm driving the car and picked him up and he stuck it in my ribs and screamed at me, I'm going to kill you. Te voy a matar. I said, in the name of Jesus. First thing, the name. And then I said, I plead the blood against you. That's the next thing you do. Satan comes to your house. You say, in the name of Jesus, I put the bloodline around here. I plead the blood. You can't cross the bloodline. My family's covered in the blood. You can't cross the blood. You go up to somebody dying in the hospital and start saying, the bloodline around them, the bloodline's around them, the bloodline's around them. The blood. Devil, you're not crossing the blood. You're not crossing the blood. I tell you, it makes a difference. And then the next thing you do is the word says... Billy Graham made the phrase famous, the Bible says. How many thousands of times do you hear Billy Graham say that when he's preaching? The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. Well, the man, that's, that's the go-to. The Word says, the Bible says. I've always said, Pastor Ron, that my favorite song in the whole world is Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Man, what a deal. How do I know Jesus loves me? The Bible tells me he does. I'm not going to argue with that. Right? In the name of Jesus. I put the blood of Jesus against you. The word says. And that's what I told that hitchhiker. I said, I said, Jesus said in Luke 10, 19. So I gave him the word. I gave him the name. Then I gave him the blood. And then I gave him the word. And I said, Jesus said in Luke 10, 19 that he gave me authority or power or dominion over uh, to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all, along the the Bible, all the power of the enemy and nothing. Nothing. I spelled it for God. N-O-T-H-I-N-G. No thing shall by any means hurt me. And then I brought the covenant in. I said, Father, that's your covenant. Now, I'm talking to the guy in Spanish. I'm talking to God in English. They, God speaks both. And so I said, I said, your covenant says, you're the faithful God that keepeth the covenant, and your covenant says no thing, N-O-T-H-I-N-G, nothing shall by any means hurt me. That means this man, his gun, his bullets cannot hurt me. Yeah. For your covenant's sake, not for my sake. Father, this isn't about me. Guy's got his gun like this and got my collar like this and said, I'm going to kill you. I said, Father, this isn't about me. This is about your covenant. Either your word's good or it's not. You're the faithful God that keepeth covenant. See, something we need to understand, I think I said to you yesterday, I say it all the time, so I may have said it to you yesterday, but if I didn't, I should have. But something you need to learn and we need to understand about covenants is they're always going to be bloody. God is a blood covenant God. Every covenant's going to be a blood covenant. Every African tribe, every Indian tribe, when they cut covenant, it's always blood. When the mafia cuts blood covenant, it's always blood. I've had people yell at me overseas for decades and say, you Americans are bloody people. You've got a bloody religion. You've got a bloody God. And I say, you're right. You, you, say, you act like that's a bad thing. It's always blood. It's always blood. I tell you, that. The, the, one of the greatest advantages we have over every false god in the world is that Jesus shed his blood. What Renee said a while ago, the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that'll, that'll, that'll help you, right? Everything you do, it's the, it's the death, the burial, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, some big church... Uh, uh, Two weeks ago at Easter time, some big famous church uh, started making announcements saying, saying, bring your, bring your friends and invite them to church on Easter Sunday, and we, we're not going to make them feel bad. We're not going to use the words Calvary. We're not going to use the words blood, and we're not going to use the word resurrection. 
I thought, how can you have Resurrection Sunday without seeing resurrection? <laughs> the thing that sets us apart from everything else is, I mean, e Easter is our Super Bowl. Yep. Right. Resurrection Sunday is a Christian's Super Bowl. It's the greatest day on a Christian's calendar. If it wasn't for Resurrection Sunday, if it wasn't for Easter, Paul said, we'd be of all men most miserable. Paul said, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then Christ did not rise. And he said, if Christ did not rise, then you're still in your sins. Right? And your faith, he said, and your preaching is in vain. And we are of all men most miserable. He said, but... Christ did rise. <laughs> so your faith in, in preaching is not in vain, and you're not dead in your sins. Amen. Isn't that amazing? But God based this thing on the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Now, a bunch of those false gods had the death and the burial, but only one had the resurrection. There's only one tomb that's empty. Right? And that's what makes the difference. So it's covenant. God cut covenant, a blood covenant, with Jesus, with us as the beneficiary. Isn't that right? When God cut covenant with Abraham in, in, in Genesis 17, he said, as I said yesterday, this, this covenant, Abraham, is between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. He didn't say this is a three-month covenant. This is a three-year covenant. Covenants have no expiration date. God's covenants have, have, don't, don't expire. They're deathless. They don't die. They're blood covenants. They have no expiration date. Right? They cross from Old Testament to New and New Testament to Old. They, there's no barrier stopping them because they're everlasting. He said, for an everlasting covenant... If he had just said, now, Abraham, this covenant is between me and you, that wouldn't do me any good. Right. Or Abraham, this is between me and you and your boy Isaac, that wouldn't do me any good. But he yeah. said, this is between me and you and your seed after the, you and their seed after them and their seed after them and their seed after them in their generation. Yes. Yes. So that covenant is still going on. Yes. There you go. And when there was a famine in the land and Isaac was, go was going to go to Egypt like everybody else was, they was all running off to Egypt to get something to eat, and Isaac said, I'm going to there's no food here. My, my farm's not working. And God said, son, don't you go over there. You stay here. Genesis 26, you stay here, and I am going to perform the oath. What oath? The oath I swore to your father. Yeah. Yeah. His father's dead and gone, yeah. but that oath's still good. Yeah. I'm going to perform the oath, the covenant that I swore to your father. And, it's, and you know the story. It says, it says Isaac stayed in the land, sowed in the land, and the same year reaped a hundredfold. And the man waxed great and grew very great and had great store of servants and great store of herds and, and cattle. And the Philistines envied him. Well, the Philistines should envy the church. Yeah. Yeah. Next time you run into a Philistine at Dairy Queen, they ought to be envying you. Yeah. Instead of the church looking at them saying, I wish I had a car like that. I wish I had a house like that. I wish I had what they had. They should be envying you. Yeah. Instead of you envying them. If we're following the covenant. Amen. So it's the name. It's the blood. It's the word. It's the covenant. And then it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Whenever that guy, when we got out of the car, and he said, give me your money, give me your stuff, and he walked up close to me, and I stuck my finger right in his face, and I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he made him mad. He took that gun barrel and hit me right in the forehead with it. Just pow, just popped like that. And it hurt, man. He knocked me back on, on my car. I'm laying on the hood of my car just seeing stars. And he put that gun right between my eyes, hammer cocked, finger on the trigger. And he said, shut up. If you say one more word, I'll kill you. And I just pushed myself off, off the car and stepped into him and right past, put my finger in his face, passed his gun. And I said, I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You can't kill me. You can't hurt me in any way. Amen. And when I did that, he just jumped backwards. We were nose to nose, but now he's like, I just jumped backwards. He's this close to me and shot at me five times at point blank range. And the bullets didn't hit me. How'd God do that? I don't know. I don't care. Amen. My car was right behind me. They didn't go in my car. They didn't break the windshield. They didn't hit the car. They didn't hit me. What do you do with them? I don't know. I don't care. 
This, this November, it'll be, it'll, this October, it'll be 50 years. It was 19, October the 16th, 1974. Wow. It was on a Wednesday. And uh, I, in all those 50 years, I've never asked the Lord, how did you do that? I don't care. That's not my business. My business is to believe it and to use the name and the blood and the word and the covenant and the power of the Holy Spirit. And his job is to do it. He said he would do it. So if we do the things to get him to do it, then that's his business how he does it. I don't care how he did it. I don't know how I raised that baby girl from the dead after 12 hours. American medical doctor. Good friend of mine standing right there with me saying, Terry, she's dead. D-E-A-D, dead. He said, I'm concerned about you. You've been praying for her for hours. And I had, I'd been praying nine hours at that time. He said, I'm concerned about you. She's dead. And he spelled it, D-E-A-D, dead. He said, now put her down. Put her on the table. We'll bury her in the morning. Let's go to bed. He said, at least you got her parents saved hours ago. Something good came out of this mess. He said, I did everything I could as a doctor. Didn't work. You did everything you could as a missionary. Didn't work. Sometimes it doesn't work. Now put her down. Let's go to bed. I'm concerned about you. And I said, I said, Bobby, you go ahead and go to bed if you want to. And Bob Lemon was with us. Bob was right there. His first, one of his first missionary trips. And uh, I'd asked Bob if he wanted to go to the jungle and do some preaching with me. And he said, sure. And he's working at Sears and Roebuck uh, store selling ty- in the automotive department in, in Woodland Hill Malls in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I, and, and I said, you want to go with me to Guatemala and do some preaching? And he said, sure. And he quit his job and never went back and worked in the world again. He worked, he worked for me and traveled with me for four, four and a half months. Then he went to work for Buddy Harrison and worked for Buddy for years and then went in his own ministry. And of course, now he's in heaven. But uh, uh, I talked to the doctor today. I sent him a text today. And, uh, and he sent me a text back. We, we're still good friends. And, and he, he didn't do anything wrong. He's just talking as a doctor. He's a faith man. He's a word man. Right. You know, he's just as a doctor. He said, Terry, she's dead. You know, I mean, I checked her hours ago. She's dead. And uh, I said, Bobby, you, you, you going to bed. This is Bobby Daniel, Dr. Bobby Daniel. And I said, Bobby, you going to bed. And I said, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to bear this baby. I'm not going to bear this baby. Now, now, again, he didn't do anything wrong. I don't want to sound like he did something wrong. No, he's just operating as a doctor. Just, just, I, mean, I mean, anybody in the right mind to say what he said, you know, it had been nine hours, you know. But I said, I'm, I'm not going to do it. And so I used the blood. I used the name. I used the blood. I used the word. I used the covenant. I used the power of the Holy Spirit. And then here's the catch. That's what I told you yesterday. This is the secret sauce. This is what makes it work. I did it again. Then I did it again. She's still dead. So I did it again. Well, she still did. So I did it again. Well, she still did. So I did it again. How many times did I do it in 12 hours? Who knows? When I get to heaven, I'm sure they've got an accounting of it because they count everything. They count the birds. They count your hairs. They count, they count every time you say an idle word. I mean, they, they, they got an accounting department. Right? So I'm sure they'll tell me how many times I said the name, how many times I said the word, how many times I said the blood, how many times, you know, but I did it for 12 hours, nonstop, you know. And she's still dead, so I did it again. And she's still dead, so I did it again. And she's still dead, so I did it again. But she's still dead, so I did it again. Yeah, but she's still dead, so I did it again. You know when I quit doing it? When she rose from the dead. I quit doing it after that. I said, thank you. I started, I changed it to thank you, thank you. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I give you praise, Lord. I give you the glory, Lord. But I didn't have to do all that stuff again because I, I, I'd done it for 12 hours and it worked. What if I'd have quit at 11 and a half? What if I'd have quit at 11? What if I'd, what if I'd have quit at 10 and a half? What if I'd have quit when he told me to at nine hours? What? How do we know what we've, what we've missed or we're stopping too soon on different things? Whether important things or simple things. But, you know, we just did it and said, eh, I didn't think it'd work anyway. You know, what, what all have we missed? But the... But the The ammunition, the tools, the weapons are the name, the blood, the word. See, it's all based one based on the other. It's the name of Jesus. It's his shed blood. The word says it. It's God's covenant. And therefore, the power of the Holy Spirit swooped in, did something with the bullets. The power of the Holy Spirit swooped in and raised her from the dead. Right? And so God gets the glory. But every miracle I've ever had. 
And I've told you a bunch of them, and I've got thousands I hadn't told you. They're all, back, they're all the same way. I use the name, and then the blood, and then the word. I mean, that, that's how this works. We don't do it one time. It's not, not one and you're done unless it works the first time. If it works the first time, I'm happy. I've, I've, I've raised the dead that way. I've gone out and told the dead, I rebuke the spirit of death off you and command you back to life in the name of Jesus. Pow, they got up. Well, praise the Lord. But she didn't get up. So I did it again. And just kept doing it. And see, we're going to have to have that kind of bulldog tenacity. Our faith has to have a bulldog faith, a bulldog tenacity. Amen? And we have to understand that that we, we don't give quarter to the enemy. Yeah, right. Amen? Amen? We don't give quarter to the enemy. Now, when David showed up, we started here last If y'all were here yesterday, you know where I'm at. If you don't, you have to get yesterday. But we talked about David, the five smooth stones, and he killed Goliath. But back up to that, we started with him getting there to see the battle, which there wasn't one. And... Uh, can you imagine this 17 year old kid so excited he's going to go to the war and see his three big brothers in the war and see them fight the bad guys and everybody's scared to hide in the foxhole? What a disappointment, right? But he had already had some experience. He, he, he told Saul, he said, look, I, I, I had a lion and a bear come out and get my daddy's sheep. And I went out there and took it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and killed him. Now that story right there is in, is in a famous, famous, famous painting. Y'all, y'all that have the 25-pound Bible on your coffee table probably has that picture in it. They have religious paintings in there, and, and that's great. I'm for it. But that painting is very famous. The original of that painting is in the Louvre Museum in Paris, France. It's there. You can go see it. But, but it's wrong. It's like I said to you yesterday. It's Bible mythology. It's not... It's not Per Bible, it's per the way people have told it down the years until it got messed up. And so what you see in that painting, go look, in fact, you can probably Google it. I haven't tried, but I, I never thought about it before. You can probably Google David killing the bear and the lion, you know. But uh, what you see in the painting is you see David's back. You're looking from the back. You're looking at David's back and then the lion and the bear's out here. And, and what it's showing is he's got his sling like this, got that rock, and he's doing this. And so uh, the, the inference... Uh, the, 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 the story it's trying to tell you is that David killed that lion and bear with the sling off at about 30 yards with a rock. But that's not what David said. He said, I went out and took it out of his mouth. Give me that sheep. That's my daddy's sheep. You put that sheep down. That's not your sheep. And went out there and took it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and killed him. I like this kid. I like him. He didn't even have a pocket knife, man. He he told Goliath, I'm going to cut your head off and didn't even have a pocket knife. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Are y'all here? Yeah. All those Bible stories, over and over and over. You know, years ago I was teaching, I mean decades and decades ago, I was teaching at a Bible school in Dallas. I blew in there and from time to time and taught the students on missions and miracles and stuff. And so I'd preach to them about miracles and crusades and stuff like that. And I told them, you know, I said, when I do an open air crusade, I don't lay hands on the sick because there's just too many people out there. You can't do it. So if you're going to be a crusadesman, you need to learn how to pray what I call a crusade prayer or a mass prayer, a prayer for the masses, one prayer for everybody. you got the Holy Ghost fall. He's the healer. You're not. And, and, and if you've got 10,000 people or 50,000 or 100,000 or whatever, you can't lay hands on that many people. So don't even start it because if you start it, and somebody sees you do it, they're going to want it, and then they're going to want it, and then they're going to want it, and they're going to want it, and you're going to kill the faith for the open prayer, the mass prayer, the crusade prayer, because they're going to want your hot little hand on them, and there's no way you can get your hot little hand on that many people. You don't think Jesus prayed for all those people when it said that he healed them all, great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all? You know, well, he just, he just prayed a crusade prayer. You know, you know John, the book of John says that, and y'all are familiar with the scripture, the book of John says if, if all the miracles that Jesus did were written down, the world couldn't contain it. Well, y'all are probably like me as a little boy. I thought, that can't be right. I mean, the world's a big place. But, you know, I've talked to Bible scholars 
that say, and they may be wrong, but I think they're right. I've talked to Bible scholars that say, at any given time, night or day, Jesus was surrounded by 20,000 people. They just followed him and 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 wanted 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 him and just day and night, day and night, day and night, day and night, day and night. So, so it just tells a few of the miracles because people are getting miracles all the time, right? So we need to understand that God is a miracle God, that miracles are his nature. Miracles are his character, the character of God. Is miracles. The nature of God is miracles. I've got an old, 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 old tape series called Miracles, the Nature of God. Uh, it, it's just, it, that's his nature. That's what he does. He didn't have to think about it. He invented miracles. Now, there were no miracles in the Garden of Eden because there was no sickness. He didn't intend for there to be miracles and healings because he didn't intend for there to be sickness and disease. So Adam and Eve didn't need healing. They didn't have sickness, but once they got in the world, once they sinned and the curse came and sickness came and disease came and garbage came, then God had to invent healings and miracles as a counterbalance, as a counteract, right? Nobody needed healed of cancer when there wasn't any cancer. But when cancer showed up, God had to say, okay, I'm adding that to the list. That's why in Deuteronomy 28... When he gives you the list of the curses and the list of the blessings, that's not all of them. That's just a bunch of them in one spot. They're all through Genesis, Exodus, and Numbers, Deuteronomy, because that's the Pentateuch or the law. So, so Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And then verse 29 says, just in case you were wondering if you're Abraham's seed or not, verse 29 says, And if you belong to Christ... Y'all belong to Christ? Yeah. It says that if you belong to Christ, you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Yeah. So that tells you, yes, you Gentiles have the promise just like the Jews do. Yeah. You get Abraham's blessing just like the Jews do. It belongs to you. That's why Jesus said that little woman in Luke chapter 13, it was all bowed over for 18 years, could no wise lift herself up. And Jesus called her to him and, and, and laid his hand on her and spoke to her. Jesus, every miracle, you read every miracle Jesus did, he either touched them or he spoke to them, or he touched them and spoke to them. Mm -hmm. He did one of those two things, or he did them both. Mm -hmm. With her, he did both. He, it said he called her to him and, said, and spoke to her and said, Woman, thou art loose from thine infirmity. Mm -hmm. Then he laid his hand on her, mm -hmm. so he did both. He spoke to her and touched her. And immediately it says she was made straight and glorified God. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And then the church got mad about it and said, You shouldn't have healed her on the Sabbath, blah, blah, blah. And Jesus said, You're hypocrites. And Jesus said, this daughter, this is the key factor right here. Jesus said, this woman is the daughter of Abraham. She ought to be loosed from the bondage of Satan. That ought to make you shout right there. I mean, you ladies are daughters of Abraham. You have the right to be, you ought to be loosed from the bondage of Satan. You men are sons of Abraham. You ought to be loosed. You have the right to be loosed from the bondage of Satan. Are y'all here? Yeah. So all those miracles and miracles and miracles and miracles and miracles, it's God's nature, it's God's character to do healing and to do miracles, right? It's not something you have to talk him into. It's his nature. It's his character. That's, his, that's what he does. It's Old Testament. It's New Testament. It crosses both Testaments. It's covenant. Yeah. Isn't it? It's blood covenant. Amen. Amen. You know, I said, yeah, I think I said it to you yesterday, that there, there are Christians that would get mad at you, would get mad at David for killing Goliath, because they say, well, you should have prayed for him. <laughs> no, there's times you just need to kill him. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you, know, you know, you need to be fierce as an Old Testament warrior. When the devil sticks his head up. Yeah. Yes, sir. Now, just in your normal everyday, going to about your business, you ought to be a sweet, nice little New Testament Christian. 
with all the gifts, all the fruit of the Spirit, you've got love, joy, grace, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, kindness, all that stuff. You just, you just praise the Lord and pass the mashed potatoes. <laughs> isn't, the, isn't the Lord good? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But when the devil sticks his head up, you need to turn into an Old Testament warrior that's fierce. See, they built the wall for Nehemiah. They built the wall with a shovel in one hand and a sword in the other. Amen? Now, I'm not talking about you going out and killing people. You know, in the Old Testament, they did go out and kill people. I'm, I'm not talking about you going and killing people. But I'm talking about you being fierce in the spirit. You be fierce and say, I'm not putting up with this. You will not, you will not cross the bloodline. You, you will not attack my family. You will not come in my house. You will not attack my marriage. You will not attack my business. You will not, you will not, you will not, you will not. You will not, you will not cross the bloodline. Right. Remember one time I was preaching in a village in, in, uh, in Burma. I was there illegally. I snuck across the border to preach to some people. And uh, uh, they sent us a message. No, didn't send me. They sent people in the village a message uh, that the Buddhist army was going to attack that night and, and burn the village to the ground. And the Buddhist army is 100,000 strong in Burma. And, but some of those soldiers, just like soldiers here in America, have relatives in different places. So when they knew they were going to attack some village and their mama lived in that village, they'd send a message and say, get out, get out, get out of the village, get in the jungle because we're going to attack tonight. And so, so messages get passed like that. And so they got a message that the Buddhist army is going to attack tonight and burn the village to the ground. Well, they, they told me about it, and they were all scared out of their minds. And uh, I was on Sunday morning, and they told us that. And, and so I got up and preached this message on, on Holy Ghost supernatural protection that I wish I knew all that stuff because I heard myself preaching it by the Holy Ghost thinking, I need to take notes on this. This is really good. This is really good. Somebody give me a notepad. I'm preaching it, but I need to be writing it. And to this day, I don't know what all I said. I know some of what I said, but I'm like, mm. nobody wrote, took notes. Nobody re recorded. I mean, we're in the jungle. And uh, so they told me, and I said, uh, and so I preached this message, this marvelous Holy Ghost, heaven message on supernatural protection. And I said, there will not be one house burned in this village, not one hut burned in this village, not one person hurt in this village. I said, in fact, when service is over, you come go with me. So when service is over and I'd prayed for people's salvation and healing and everything else, uh, I let them all out. It's like the Pied Piper. We're walking out of town with the whole village, you know. And I got so far out of the village to, in this dirt trail, dirt road, and I took the heel of my shoe, and I said, I'm going to draw a line right here. And I drew a line across, and I said, in the name of Jesus, they will not cross this line. This is the bloodline. They will not cross this line. If, I, if they do, I'm not a man of God. And so we all went to bed that night. They woke me up early the next morning. They said, Brother Terry, Brother Terry. I said, what? They said, they didn't come. They didn't, they didn't burn the village. They didn't do it. They didn't show up. Nothing happened. We're, we're saved. I said, well, praise the Lord. That's what I expected. They said, yeah, but guess what happened? I said, I don't know what happened. And they said, out of town, the Buddhist temple burned to the ground. And they said, and we didn't do it. Nobody did it. Nobody did it. It just burned to the ground. And I said, well, that's, that's a shame. And they said, and, the, and, and, and three of the priests, three of the monks are hurt. And I said, well, let's go help them. And they said, oh, they won't let you out there. I said, well, I'll, yeah, I'll go help those guys. And so I went out there, and, and here's these three monks sitting on the ground, bald-headed and orange robes, you know how they are. And, uh, and when they saw me coming, I felt so bad because when they saw me coming, fear and terror was in their face because they thought I did it, you know. And they started, they started and they were sitting on the ground, so they just started crab walking backwards, you know, just, no, no, no. And I said, hey, guys, come on. I didn't hurt you. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm going to pray for you. And, I mean, I, they were scared out of their minds, thought I was some kind of, you know, supernatural being or something. And uh, I told the pastors in that town, I said, pastors, they'll never rebuild here. It's bad karma. Buddhists will not rebuild here. I said, so it's the best spot in town. Oh, a nice little hill. I said, y'all just build a church here. <laughs> so they did. Praise the Lord. Amen. But we, we've got to understand the, 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 the power in the name. In the power in the blood and the power in the word and the power in the covenant and the power of the Holy Spirit. There is no power like the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I mean, Holy Ghost power is absolutely <laughs> number one. Amen. So, did you get anything out of all this? I've got a whole lot more to say, but I think since it's 830, I'm going to let you go. We start at 630. So, uh, we'll pick this up again tomorrow night.
And then in the morning, I'm going to start something new, and, I, and I've really been praying about it, and I believe God's going to let me teach something that I haven't taught in decades and decades and decades. Uh, but it's so necessary for the church. I'm surprised preachers hadn't written books about it. I'm surprised I hadn't written a book about it. I, I, I should have back in the 70s when I first started preaching it, and I preached it all over the world. But I want to talk to you about, uh, about some real important things uh, and, and maybe even some controversial things. Uh, I've had I've had pastors overseas when I preach they just stand right up in, right up in the church and challenge me over it. And of course, I've proved them wrong in the Word, but uh, I mean it's a it's a it's a thorn in their flesh. And so, if I can, uh, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, I'm gonna, I'm going to minister along those lines in the mornings. But uh, we'll uh, we'll do faith and more than conquerors at night. All right. Stand up with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for ministering to us by the Holy Ghost. Father, we realize that hell hates us, that we have a target on our back, but they can't cross the bloodline. They can't cross the bloodline. And Father, I want to get into some things this week about, well, I can't, I, I can't get into that now. I believe this week will prove to be a, 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 an epic week. Yeah. Epic. An epic week. That we'll walk out of here knowing, understanding, realizing we're bigger than we thought we were, better than we thought we were, and can do more than we thought we could do. Sure. Because faith stretches us. Faith stretches us. Faith causes us to go from impossible to hard to done. And we thank you for it. I thank you for it. And give you glory and honor and praise and majesty and dominion. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Now everybody just put your hand on yourself and put one hand up to heaven. That's where your help comes from. Those of you watching online tonight... If you're in a hospital room or a jail cell or a hotel room or your living room, uh, if you can, if you're in town and, then, and you can, then get to us here this week. Come, come be with us. Don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together. But, but uh, if that's not, if you live somewhere else or you're away or whatever, uh, let this same anointing go in you. Because the Word says it's the anointing that destroys the yoke. It's the anointing. It's the anointing. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke. doesn't just break it. It destroys it. doesn't bend it. It destroys it. doesn't make it feel bad. It destroys it. So whatever yoke's represented in the house tonight or any of those of you watching online or listening on another platform in the future, whatever yoke that might be represented in your marriage, in your business, in your home, in your health, in your finances, uh, with your kids, whatever it is, then the anointing can destroy that yoke tonight. Now, Holy Spirit, I pray right now in the name of the Lord Jesus, both here in the house and there online, fall right now. Fall right now, right now. Fall right now. Holy Spirit, do right now the will of God. From the crown of our head to the soles of our feet, the anointing that destroys, the destroying anointing, the anointing that destroys the yoke of bondage, penetrate, saturate, permeate us, and drive out every sickness, every disease. Destroy it. Just like a radiation machine would radiate and destroy cancer, the anointing is a much greater radiation, and it killed Uzzah when he touched the Ark of the Covenant. That same anointing will kill and destroy sickness and disease. And you said the power of life and death is in the tongue, and I speak death to disease. Yes. Yes. Cancer, lupus, leukemia, COVID, AIDS, whatever your name might be, I curse you by Almighty God. I curse you as Jesus cursed the fig tree. And it withered and died from its very roots. You wither and die. We break your power. We cancel your assignment. You will not grow any longer. You'll not parasite off of our bodies any longer. I curse you, curse you, curse you in the name of Jesus. Plead the blood of Jesus against you. 
The Word says Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. The Word says by His stripes we are healed. By His stripes we were healed. Himself bore our infirmities, carried our sickness, disease, and sorrow. And if He carried it, we don't have to carry it. The covenant declares it. It's covenant. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we declare it done tonight. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. The anointing. That same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Now quicken your mortal body. Make alive your mortal body. New bones. New joints. New organs. Creative miracles. Creative miracles, Father. We've seen you do it so many times. Creative miracles. Do it tonight. Do it this week. Create what needs to be created. Destroy what needs to be destroyed. Drive out what needs to be driven out. We curse every spirit of infirmity. We can't kill you, but we can cast you out. You foul spirit of infirmity. Loose this people. Loose them right now in Jesus' name. Uh, A spirit of infirmity is uh, something the doctors might call a chronic disease. Chronic means it comes and goes, comes and goes. Uh, Let's just give an example, maybe migraine headaches. They they come and go and come and go. So the doctors would say, you have chronic migraine headaches. You don't have them 24 hours a day, but they come and they go and they come and they go. And, and, And chronic diseases are a real good hiding place for spirits of infirmity. It doesn't mean you're demon-possessed. It means, it means a spirit of infirmity has come to, to harass you and bug you and, ha- and, and, and buffet you and so on. So the very spirit of infirmity. Many times we cast this spirit out and all of a sudden people heal of some chronic disease they've had forever and never have it again. So you foul spirit of infirmity. Loose God's people tonight. Loose them tonight. Loose them. This time you will go and not come again. You go, you go, you go, you go. You have no choice but to go. But this time you don't come. You don't come. Your assignment's canceled. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Now right there, right there again. Right there again. There's some bones being healed right now. Spines being touched. All the anointing, Father, the anointing, the anointing, the anointing, the anointing, the anointing. Thank you, Father, for healing, wholeness, soundness, wellness. In the name of Jesus, deliverance. And we thank you for it. Now just just, just lift your hands and thank him. Don't, Don't clap, just lift your hands and thank him. Hallelujah. Thank you. Jesus is the healer. We wouldn't touch your glory. We give you the glory. We would not touch your glory. There's the anointing again right there. Some of you need to do what you couldn't do. If you couldn't bend over, bend over. If you couldn't lift your arm, lift your arm. If you couldn't see, see. You couldn't move your neck, move your neck. If you had a tumor or growth or not, check that out. If you had a pain, check that out. Most everybody Jesus healed in the Gospels, he told them to go do something impossible. He said, go show yourself to the priest. He said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. He said, take up your bed and walk. He told people to do impossible things. So they would act their faith. They would put faith in action. So do what you couldn't do. Make your miracle happen. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Glory, glory, glory. Jesus, we give you the, we give you the glory. We give you the honor. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Glory to God. Now look up here at me. Put your hands down. Look up here at me. If you've checked yourself, and if you hadn't checked yourself, you need to check yourself because you know when the, when, the, when the minister asks you to do something in the spirit, then you need to go ahead and do that. Um, but if you've checked yourself and there's a difference, pain's gone, pain was there, pain's gone, or you can do something you couldn't do, let me, let me see your hand. If you can do something you couldn't do. There, there's a hand there. There's a hand there. There's several hands right there, right here. Two more back there. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Now, there's always a last one, so just keep believing here, and you, you might be the last one. There's always a next one. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. 
grow with you. If you had a tumor or growth or not, something like that, check that. See that it's gone or moved. I like it if they just move. They get smaller. I like something to happen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's praise the Lord again one more time. Thank you, Father. Glory, 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 glory. We give you glory. We give you glory. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. Glory, 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 glory. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you. Oh, Rabba Hashanda Labaha Rando Roboko. Ronye Nemaha Sanda Labaha. Jesus is the healer. Jesus is the healer. Thank you, Lord. Healing belongs to us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. You said the power of life and death is in the tongue. We've spoken death to disease. Now we speak life to the people. The Zoe life of God. The Zoe life of God. Live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Glory. Glory, 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 glory. Thank you, Jesus. Now go ahead and check yourself out and see what the Lord's done. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You in the States, we're kind of nice to you, and we just do this just for three or four minutes and quit. But, you know, overseas, I'll have them do it for a long time. In my crusade, big crusade with thousands and thousands of people, you know, we'll do that eight or ten times. Okay, let's praise the Lord again. Okay, put your hands down. Do what you couldn't do. Okay, let's praise the Lord again. Okay, put your hands down. Okay, praise the Lord again. Because every time you give God praise, He shows up again. How do you know that? Well, God inhabits the praise of His people. So every time you praise, He shows up. Yes. Amen. The more you praise, the more he shows up. Amen. Doesn't take much to figure that out, does it? Amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Anybody else? God's healed you. God's touched you. God's done something. Thank you, Jesus. Yep, yep. Thank you, Jesus. Well, good. Praise the Lord. Now, be sure and tell somebody about it. I'm not going to have you do it tonight because of the time, but I, I, I used to always do that and take a long time, but, but it's important that you tell it. And I'll say this one thing and let you go. Brother Hagen probably taught us one of the greatest things, some of us young preachers, years and years and years and years ago. And he'd say, boys, he said, let me tell you how faith works. And he said, the woman with the, with the issue of blood, he said, that's how faith works. He said, number one, she heard it. Mark chapter 5 says, says when she heard of Jesus, she heard it. Then she said it. She said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made whole. He said, then she did it. She went out and found him and touched him. And then she received it. It says, she felt in her body she was healed of that plague, and straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up. And then the last thing, number five, she told it. She started to leave and just leave. And she said, wait, who touched me? Who touched me? Who? And she fell down and said, and she told him all the truth. So she heard it. You've heard it tonight. She said it. Have you all said it? We'll just say it a few hundred more times. Then she did it. Then she received it. And then she told it. It's always vital to tell it. Now, Jesus did say this, and it's kind of a bummer. I uh, wish he hadn't said it sometimes, but Jesus did say, If you're ashamed of me before yeah. men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father. But if you'll testify of me before men, I'll testify of you before my Father. So anytime you see that you're healed, you need to tell somebody. Tell somebody, Jesus, heal me. Jesus, heal me. If you're watching online, same thing. There's a, there's a number up there or an address or some email or some way to get over the church. Uh, tell them, say, hey, when Terry prayed for me, I did the impossible and God healed me. And you need to say that. You need to testify of that and give God the glory. Amen. Well, Pastor, let's start again in the morning. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. I'm got, so excited got, for tomorrow morning. Got two, got, two ser- got two sermons. Yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow morning. Got, got living to give, and you got 1030 tomorrow, 630 yeah. tomorrow night. Let's do it. Amen. Thank you. I want you to do one more thing. Just lift your hands one more time and say, we call this week holy. We call this week holy. We call Epic. this week holy. Epic. I can hardly wait. Love you. Bye.